So this is my normal working station, um, and I would have my dissecting scope here. But then the tools I actually use are pretty much everyday things. So I keep them in such fine, well-preserved boxes. I think this kept getting slammed in the drawer. And all of these things are to help me pick an embryo and put it exactly where I want it on a microscope slide. And I just went shopping at the department store, and I think that they assumed I would be doing painting or something like that. But my new smallest brush is actually a triple zero, which is even then probably a little bit too big to pick up a single embryo, and maybe it gets down to a single hair. And actually my most favorite tool is a glass stick. That's it. That's all it is. Um, it was a glass capillary tube. Um, this is it. Um, I don't know how well you can see that. It's not very big at all. The bit of labeling tape is just so I can find it when I put it down somewhere. And all I did was take a cigarette lighter and flame the end to make it soft. And this is perfect because the tissue won't stick to glass like it could stick to plastic and it's soft so I can very gently rotate and move around my tissues when I want to analyze them in detail. But in order to make that sort of tool, because it's just glass and they break, I have, amongst other things, a cigarette lighter. And I don't smoke at all, so I put my initials on it because it's part of my official microscopy toolbox of things I'm using on a regular basis. You kind of do it by eye and you simply flame the end until you've melted the glass back a bit. Looks pretty good. That's about it. Now I have a new tool already. So my very broad interdisciplinary field is evolutionary developmental genetics, which sounds like really a lot of things at once. But what we really want to do is understand how starting with the very early egg, an embryo knows how to make the three-dimensional form of its body, how the different cells can move into the right position. And we then do this in a comparative way across different species. I did my bachelor's degree in the United States um, in what's called a liberal arts college, which is perfect for me. Um, it basically meant I didn't have to specialize until pretty late. And it wasn't unusual that in any one semester, let's see, one semester I had introductory embryology, which feeds onto what I do now, but I was also then doing organic chemistry, background science, okay. But additionally, I was doing ancient Chinese history, and I was doing a classics course entitled Decadence and Salvation in the Roman Empire. And this was perfect for me, because I really didn't want to be too specialized. Of course, what I just told you, my topic is completely specialized to this tiny little thing, but at the beginning, the field of evolutionary developmental genetics is in a way kind of cheating because it's three different disciplines of biology all at the same time. The particular structures we're interested in aren't actually the embryo itself. There are extra embryonic membranes that protect the embryo while it's developing, but these are made of cells too, so in early development they actually have to grow around the embryo to cover it, and this is good because then it's protecting it against desiccation in the environment, or maybe it helps with immune response against infection from pathogens, something like this. So they're quite a good thing to have. But in later development, they actually have to open up and pull back again. Otherwise, the embryo little thing is getting stuck inside, and that's also not good. And we're very interested in, first, this formation of how the membranes go over, and later on, how they actively fold up and contract. So it's kind of a yin and yang reciprocal process. And at the cellular level, the cells have to then stretch out and become really, really thin, or completely change their shape. And later on, when they're folding up, they need to know exactly how to fold in the context of the tissue. And since they're extra embryonic, ultimately they go on to die. So it's controlled cell death later in development that leaves the embryo free to finish the process. Lots of things are very serendipitous in science generally. So you think you have this great hypothesis and you know exactly what you're going to test, but sometimes some of the most interesting results are quite to the side of what you could possibly have predicted, which is good because if we knew everything in advance, there would be no research to do. So during my PhD, I wanted to look at one particular gene in my insect species, the milkweed bug. We thought, based on what was going on in the other species, that this gene would be very important early in development for giving the identity of these extra embryonic tissues. So of course, at the beginning of development, you have one fertilized zygote where the egg and sperm have come together. Then you have lots of duplications. You have a lot of cells. But this is still pretty much a single field of tissue that's not really differentiated yet, it's pretty uniform. So this is where some of these genes we study come in to say, okay, this part will be the head, this part will be muscle, 
this part will be extra embryonic. And we thought this gene would be important to say, U cells will be extra embryonic tissue. And so we had all of these grand plans about detailed examination of early development. I knocked down the gene. And what I actually found was that the gene is important during development, during embryonic development in the extra embryonic domain, but had nothing to do with early development, nothing to do with identity or initial specification. And then these poor guys ended up not being little insects that go on to hatch from the egg and walk around, but under, unfortunately they were rather upside down, inside out, and backwards. So I could see that the little pigmented body was pretty tiny, here's my whole egg, and then the rest of it was this white stuff, which I thought was just some of the yolk that didn't get used. Um, and it was only later I realized that actually the white stuff was the organ tissue outside of the body, and having carefully not damaged this tiny little body, finally one day I actually opened it up and literally out popped the legs. Because with the body being pretty small, the antennae and legs had developed normally, but they were really tucked into this small space. So, yeah, kind of dramatic when you have it highly magnified down the microscope. And of course, as seems to happen with really new, interesting discoveries, it happened late on a Friday night. And in this case, actually, I was doing these experiments um, as a visitor in a host lab in the United States, which is really good in expertise for that particular species. And by this time, everybody had gone home. So I thought, oh, hmm, okay, well, this is really exciting. I don't know quite what's going on, but I have to tell somebody. So I phoned my parents. <laughs> I mean, on that occasion, having worked in so many places, I was actually, I think I was in the same time zone. So it was kind of late for them, but not too bad. Mom, Dad, guess what I just did? What, hon? I made an insect go inside out. Oh, well done, honey. <laughs> My parents are great. They're not scientists at all, but they generally try to understand what's going on and take the idea of, okay, if it's going well and I'm happy, then they're happy for me, which is quite sweet, really. I'm actually very organized, so I've kept every single lab notebook ever, and for the most part, I also number them sequentially from the very beginning. So I'm now up to, oh, I don't know, maybe book 10, page <laughs> something, I don't know. But um, because I was doing this when I was visiting a lab, it was not in a bound notebook, but rather in a spiral book, which I don't know if you can see was actually some time ago, but indeed it was the launch point for what I've been doing since. Um, in a way though I should say it was a launch point because when I started to think about what was going wrong, that was very dramatic to be inside out, but when I understood actually what the normal developmental situation was and how complicated that was to get it right, I thought, well that's amazingly complicated and also really beautiful. Okay, I want to know more about this. And so in a way it was kind of a change in research direction from what I'd done before. So yes, um, in my notebook here, let's see, I was being very careful and precise with lots of little notes, so I was actually checking my samples and eggs quote, every hour, every two hours, really frequently. It was my first time doing this, I was really excited about it, and so my very first official description in the lab notebook of what this new result was, was that I had generated quote-unquote necrotic zombies. But I have to say that when you really get a new result like this, that's really fun because there isn't any set protocol of you check this and that and the other. You have to kind of go with what you already know and do your best and say, okay, well, what makes sense or what should I find out? And yeah, the actual synthesis and putting it together is really exciting. That's where all of the newness comes in. Yes, um, I'm a very visual person, and although with my general interdisciplinary background of doing organic chemistry and mathematics, my data are effectively pictures and colors. So we're very interested in, for example, doing a staining to visualize where a gene is active in which tissues at which developmental stages, and then we're using microscopes to take pictures of these sorts of things. At one point when, at the age of seven, I hated long division because I didn't get it, I thought, nope, I'm not going to do this, I'm going to be an artist and I'll simply sell every painting for a million dollars, no problem. Of course, that wasn't very realistic, but I always did love to do visual arts, so I was doing classes for drawing, painting, sculpture, all these things every single summer, often during the academic year through high school when I could, and this I continued a bit through the time when I was doing my bachelor's. But when I was a teenager, I thought, mm, if I'm not going to go to university, I would love to go to a studio of a particular artist that's blowing glass and creating all of these beautiful glass sculptures. So 
it's kind of nice to think, well, if I hadn't done this, there would have been these other paths to have followed. But in a way, the artistic aspect comes back into everything I do, looking at pictures and saying what I do now is beautiful. So there is very much an aesthetic quality running through all of that. Beautiful means that I can actually do live imaging where we've illuminated structures in the cell, for example, the nucleus or the outline of the cell in, say, fluorescent green or red. And you can actually really watch what's happening over time as the cells are rearranging in the tissue to make a new structure. And it's really lovely to actually see, okay, this is how development works. Just the complexity of morphogenesis and the fact that it then is so robust I just find it amazing. And that's the mechanism I'm, I guess, trying to go for in my research these days, is to really understand how it gets it right almost every time, because it is so robust, but so complicated.